Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Rule Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and last time I talked about John Brown's early life and his struggle to make ends meet while in Pennsylvania and Ohio. Now we will see him become more active in the fight against slavery. The Nat Turner Rebellion sent shockwaves through the nation. Southern states began implementing stricter slave laws and black codes to hopefully prevent another such rebellion, but the North reacted as well. Pro-slavery mobs made up of Northerners and Southerners attacked abolitionists over the next couple of years. A pro-slavery mob grabbed William Lloyd Garrison on his way to deliver an anti-slavery speech in Boston, tied him and drug him through the city streets. Garrison did not believe in violence and asserted that violence was the tool of slavers that he would never use to combat them. However, the anti-abolitionist attacks hit a whole new level in 1837. Elijah Lovejoy fought against slavery by operating an anti-slavery newspaper. His print shop in St. Louis got destroyed by a pro-slavery mob. Then he moved his operation across the river to Illinois, where mobs destroyed his printing press on multiple occasions, including throwing it into the river. The town wanted to stop the printing of his newspaper, but he stood up for himself, arguing that he had a right to free speech and the freedom of the press. On November 7, 1837, a pro-slavery mob overpowered the 20 men sent to guard Lovejoy, and once in the building they used a shotgun to kill Lovejoy. Anti-slavery politicians recalled at such a horrible act perpetrated by pro-slavery citizens. At the second prayer meeting memorial held for Lovejoy in Hudson, led by a professor of theology from Western Reserve College, John Brown heard the professor talk about the horrible murder. The speech riled up Brown, and he stood up and declared, Here before God, in the presence of these witnesses, from this time, I consecrate my life to the destruction of slavery. His father stood up beside him and stated, When John the Baptist was beheaded, the disciples took up his body and laid it in a tomb, and went and told Jesus, Let us now go to Jesus and tell him. Tears rolled down the old man's face as he led the group in prayer. This was a turning point for John Brown. So far, he acted in secret, helping individual slaves. From then on, he would challenge the institution directly. The Lovejoy episode turned other abolitionists away from violence. It sped Brown on a path toward it. After he declared publicly his mission to destroy slavery, he gathered his sons around him and asked them to pledge to him armed resistance to the institution of slavery. The boys agreed, and he led them in prayer. In the late 1830s, Brown got caught up in land speculation. He purchased a farm known as Westlands that had been deemed a perfect farm by him. He borrowed the funds for the purchase from the Western Reserve Bank and signed over his promissory note to six other people as a security. His haymaker land deal seemed more dismal when the canal planned for the area got rerouted and it plummeted the value of his land. Worse yet, water was to be drained from the Cuyahoga River reducing the water supply and haymaker, making the land less valuable. Brown wasn't the only one suffering in the late 1830s. The Panic of 1837, brought on by Jackson's bank war, hurt Americans financially. The Western Reserve Bank filed a lawsuit against Brown for lack of payment, and he referred them to those on the promissory note. This led him to into even more battles with creditors and lawsuits filed against him. Needing money in a hurry to placate the Ohio Bank's filing lawsuits, he came up with a plan to herd cattle to Connecticut for sale, and while there, he would get a loan from a bank in New York or Boston to pay off his Ohio debts. In November 1838, Brown drove a herd of cattle to Connecticut and sold them to a firm called Wadsworth & Wells. Then he proceeded to Manhattan where he failed to find a loan. Another possible spot to receive a loan was Boston. On his way there, he visited a grade school and lectured them on social justice and the evils of slavery. During the lecture, he asked who would use their time and effort to fight against the institution of slavery. Many hands went up. Then he made the question even more serious, asking who would dedicate their efforts to end slavery. Two boys stood up. Brown put his hand on their heads and blessed the boys in the name of God, who is your father and the father of the African, the son who is your savior and the savior and master of the African, and the Holy Spirit, which gives you strength and which gives strength and comfort to the African. He arrived in Boston the day after Christmas as a beggar, begging some friends of a friend for a loan. He was so confident that the loan would come through that on his way back to Ohio, he purchased a flock of Saxony sheep for $130. When he arrived in Ohio, 
no loan came, and he resolved to drive another herd east and go to Boston again, searching for a loan, this time for about $20,000. Brown returned to Connecticut with another herd of cattle, then went to Boston again, but the possibility of a loan became bleak. He wrote to Mary, I am now somewhat in fear that I shall fail at getting the money I expected on the loan. Should that be the will of Providence, I know of no other way, but we must consider ourselves very poor, for our debts must be paid, if paid at a sacrifice. Should that happen, though it may not, I hope God, who is rich in mercy, will grant us grace to conform to our circumstances with cheerfulness and true resignation. His financial frustration drove him to do something that was at best unethical. He borrowed, to put it kindly, $5,500 from Wadsworth and Wells without telling them. It is unclear whether he simply held on to the proceeds of the cattle sale, which he should have given them their portion, or pilfered the money from the cash box in the West Hartford office. At any rate, he immediately sent the money back to Ohio to pay part of the loan on the Westlands farm. The firm threatened to have him arrested, but he held them at bay. He met George Kellogg during his stay in the East. George was an agent of the New England Wool Company of Rockville, Connecticut. Finding that Brown raised sheep and was somewhat of an expert in wool quality, Kellogg gave him an advance of $2,800 to send wool to the company once Brown returned to Ohio. Brown took Kellogg's money and gave it to Wadsworth and Wells. By June, Kellogg grew concerned that Brown did not live up to his end of the bargain. Brown still hoped that a loan would come from Boston and intended to pay Kellogg the money back when that loan came through. It seems as though Kellogg felt sympathy for Brown and thought his actions well-intentioned, not nefarious. Kellogg was right. In October 1842, Brown declared bankruptcy, but Brown would send Kellogg small amounts of money to repay the debt, even leaving $50 in his will to go toward Kellogg. However, he never came close to repaying the full amount. During all of this, Brown had two more children, Oliver in 1839 and Peter in 1840. In 1840, still attempting to rescue himself from crippling debt, he took part in another venture. His father was a trustee in the Oberlin Collegiate Institute. A wealthy philanthropist donated a large section of land to the Institute in Western Virginia, now West Virginia. It needed to be surveyed because of conflicting land titles, and Owen secured his son the job of performing the survey. In exchange for a dollar a day, plus expenses, and the promise that he could purchase a thousand acres cheaply from the Institute from its holdings in Western Virginia. At the end of the survey, Oberlin offered him a thousand acres of land, but at the time, Brown contemplated a partnership with a gentleman in Hudson and did not accept the offer. When he thought better of the partnership and said he would receive the offer, the Institute was in financial straits and they rescinded the offer. Brown haggled with them and ended up with a $29 settlement. Also in 1840, the bank sold his farm implements at Westlands to help pay off his debts, and in October, the land went up for sale. Brown now resided solely on his Hudson property. In an early display of his violent tendencies, he occupied the now sold land with his three oldest sons, armed with muskets. A sheriff arrested three of the Brown men, but released them quickly upon getting to the Akron jail. Because Brown signed a bond of conveyance to another gentleman, and taken out liens against his property. The ownership of Westlands went to the Ohio Supreme Court, but Brown ultimately lost the property. When he declared bankruptcy in 1842, the court listed an inventory of Brown's possessions. The list reflects a very humble lifestyle. The inventory included one pot cracked, 50 cents, four wooden pails, old, one dollar, 12 cents and a half, six bedsteads, old, five dollars and 25 cents, Three bags, old, one dollar. Six feather beds, old and poor, six dollars. Two spinning wheels, two dollars. Four milk pans, a dollar. One glass bottle, ten cents. One tin canister, nine cents. And two earthen pots, broken, of no value. The list suggests that the children, who now numbered twelve, ranging from the twenty-year-old John to an infant Austin born in September, were crammed into five beds. Brown did get to keep some of his animals and a small amount of farm tools, but these were paltry. 1843 was a hard year for the Brown family. They moved into a rentable cabin, and in September, the six-year-old Charles came down with dysentery. Soon, three other children came down with the illness and died in rapid succession. Before the year came to a close, Brown buried four of his children, including an infant. 
In January 1844, Brown visited Akron, Ohio, and looked up Simon Perkins, the son of a War of 1812 general, who owned a substantial sheep herd and farm. Brown may not have been good with finances, but he knew three things very well, the Bible, leather, and wool. The latter impressed Perkins, who agreed to a partnership with Brown, where Brown would merge his small herd of sheep with Perkins' larger one. The family moved to Akron, where John could tend the sheep, supervise shearing, and send wool to distributors in the Northeast. Perkins also rented Brown a house for $30 a year. This began to turn life around for John, at least for the moment. He became financially stable, able to send money to two of his children, John Jr. and Ruth, who attended Grand River Institute. Brown wrote that, Divine Providence seems to smile on our works at this time. I think this is the most comfortable and the most favorable arrangement of my worldly concerns that I have ever had, and calculated to afford us more leisure for improvement by day and by night than any other. I do hope that God has enabled us to make it in mercy to us, and not that he should send leanness into our soul. Brown managed around 1,500 sheep, and although a good judge of wool, his herdsman abilities lacked considerable knowledge. He tended to them lovingly, but could not get them to mind. Brown also acted as an agent, sent around the region to acquire new sheep or sell others. John Brown was very much a man of his time. A growing labor movement covered the country, with labor unions springing up to combat companies who took advantage of their workers. Brown saw this in the wool industry, where he believed large purchasers and growers conspired together to pay low prices for excellent quality wool. Taking advantage of the public, whether slaves or free, irritated John to a great degree, so he proposed a plan to Perkins. He would travel east to Springfield, Massachusetts and open up a wool distribution center. Brown would warehouse wool from growers in Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Vermont, and Virginia, sort the wool, and price it according to quality, and then arrange for sales to eastern companies. Brown, for his expert eye for wool, would receive two cents per pound of wool sorted and sold. Perkins agreed to the investment plan, and in June 1846, Brown, with his sons Jason and John Jr., moved to Springfield and began the operation. In November that year, Brown's family notified him that his youngest daughter, Amelia, died from being scalded to death in a household accident. Aside from the death of Amelia, Brown's life looked great, especially the business in Springfield. He and his sons processed around 300 tons of wool, while Brown also neatly kept the account books. Even though the business looked great from the outside, inside it possessed great struggles due to John Brown himself. A businessman who knew Brown in Springfield said, Uncle John was no trader. He waited until his wools were graded, then fixed a price. If this suited the manufacturers, they took the fleeces. If not, they bought elsewhere, and Uncle John had to submit finally to a much less price than he could have got. Yet he was a scrupulously honest and upright man, hard and inflexible, but everybody had just what belonged to him. Brown was in a position to make a fortune, and a regular bread merchant would have done so, but, as I said, it was a failure. One of his biographers stated, Brown was driven by a deep bitterness against what he regarded as exploitive corporations. Having long been a shepherd and farmer, he saw such rural workers as innocent pawns of scheming capitalists. Never a capitalist himself, he now launched his own war against those who he believed were taking advantage of farmers. John Brown had his own model, one allied with what today would be called a producer's cooperative, in which producers organized for mutual support and financial equity. In a widely distributed circular titled, To Wool Growers, Brown stated that as the middleman between farmers and capitalists, he could gain fair treatment for producers of wool. His inflexible nature made him stick to his desired price and not budge, even when the market demanded it. An 1846 tariff passed by Congress reduced the taxes on imported wool and drove the prices of wool lower than Brown was willing to sell them, wanting to get the best price for the wool people entrusted him with. Brown refused to engage in cutthroat competition, and this ultimately became his downfall, that and the fact that he was often clueless about available funds. After ten months of business, Brown moved his family to Springfield and lived in very humble abodes. Much of the money they could spare went to support black families who they helped escape north. By 1849, the wool business Brown started began to fall apart and go into debt because of his bullheadedness. That characteristic also brought him into conflict with a craze going around the country at the time, hypnotism. 
Brown doubted the ability of hypnotists, and when the famed hypnotist Leroy Sunderland performed one of his shows, John Brown stood up and pronounced the affair a humbug and challenged him to a demonstration. Brown asserted that tolerance to pain revolved around a person's willpower, not being hypnotized. So they scheduled a demonstration where Sunderland drug a nettle across the skin around John Brown's neck, who remained stoic in his chair. Then Sunderland drug it across a hypnotized woman who did not flinch. Only when Sunderland released her from the hypnotism did she scream before putting her back under. Next, Sunderland put a vial of ammonia under Brown's nose, which sent him reeling backward. He did the same to the lady, and she again did not budge. Brown composed himself until he got out of the auditorium. Then he clawed his neck in pain and remained up all night suffering from the nettle. The next morning, he wrote a letter to the local paper saying that there may be something to hypnotism. John always thought about the African-American community, and when he learned of a large parcel of land purchased by a wealthy anti-slavery reformer named Garrett Smith for the settlement of free blacks and fugitive slaves, Brown purchased a 244-acre plot at a dollar an acre from Smith with the intention of helping fugitive slaves obtain a place to live and to help them farm. Smith's town was called North Elba in the Adirondacks of upstate New York. Brown moved his family to North Elba while he ran the wool business in Springfield. With the price of wool dropping, Brown devised a plan to sell his product in Europe. He sailed with some of his wool to Liverpool, then continued to London. He attempted to sell his wool, but eventually it would go up at auction. While he waited, he traveled across the channel to France, visiting Paris and discussing wool trade with one of their larger firms. They agreed to travel to London to view his product. Then Brown traveled to Brussels, Hamburg, Switzerland, and Italy. During his journey, he visited the Waterloo battlefield and viewed multiple military reviews for various countries. When he returned to England, he found his wool sold at auction for lower than his prices in the United States. To rub salt in the wound, he found that an American company that he did business with purchased his wool for 52 cents per pound for the same wool they offered to pay 60 cents per pound for in Springfield. Again, Brown lost money in this venture, this time to the tune of $40,000. The only good event that occurred on his European trip came when Brown won a medal for some Saxony sheep he brought with him at the World Fair in London, and when wool purchasers tested his knowledge of the fiber and attempted to trick him with poodle hair, Brown examined the hair and said, Gentlemen, if you have any machinery that will work up dog's hair, I would advise you to put this into it. His expertise in grading and identification were superb, but that did not help his business acumen. In October 1850, Brown closed the Perkins and Brown Agency. He traveled around the region paying his creditors what he could and placate in the others. Brown spent much of 1851 and 1852 in legal cases for the wool distribution business. Perkins funded Brown's trips over the Northeast representing the company, but it only zapped funds and energy from Brown. On April 26, 1852, Brown lost another child, an infant son, the seventh child out of 13 children from his second marriage to die. Also around this time, his children's piousness came into question. John Jr. and Jason became agnostic, and some of the younger children became skeptical of religion. As always, in Calvinistic fashion, Brown blamed himself for his children straying away from the religion. To one of his son's letters, he replied with a six-page sermon, invoking Old Testament rhetoric about backsliding and false prophets. By 1853, he found himself in Ohio, attempting to reunite the partnership with Perkins, but it ultimately ended on good terms but Perkins did not want to do business with John Brown. Brown needed to travel to North Elba, but possessed no funds to make the journey. So he rented a farm to grow crops to sell, but most of his crops got wiped out by a drought. While he labored away in Ohio, his 20th and last child was born, a girl named Ellen, named after the infant who passed away five years prior. In the winter, he moved back to North Elba as poor as ever. His time in Springfield only boosted his resolve for a plan a plan to free the enslaved peoples of the United States. He shared the idea with the free black community of Springfield and other cities in the Northeast. Many were receptive, and it gained a lot of attention. One of those who took an interest in Brown's plan to invade the South was Frederick Douglass, a former slave who escaped his bondage in 1838. In November 1847, he went to the Brown house, and he and Brown sat at the dinner table for seven hours discussing his plan to liberate the enslaved. 
They spread a map out on the table, and Brown pointed out the Appalachian Mountains and said, These mountains were placed here to aid the emancipation of your race. They are full of natural forts, where one man for defense could be equal to a hundred for attack. They are also full of good hiding places, where a large number of men could be concealed and baffle in a lewd pursuit for a long time. I know these mountains well and can take a band of men into them and keep them there in spite of all the efforts of Virginia to dislodge me and drive me out. The plan was for twenty-five hand-picked men to divide up into five groups of five stationed in a southward direction along the mountain range. Periodically, the groups would liberate plantations close to them, taking the stout and able-bodied into their ranks, arming them with weapons to continue the work, while the others, unable to fight, would be sent north on what Brown called the subterranean passway. Eventually, a free black colony would live in the mountains and periodically add into their ranks and liberate the slaves of Virginia gradually. He did not envision a general slave insurrection, but simply liberation. But if the shedding of blood was necessary by the retreating liberators against their pursuers, he was for it. He stated, No people could have self-respect or be respected who would not fight for their freedom. Besides, slavery was a state of war to which the slaves were unwilling parties, and consequently they have a right to anything necessary to their peace and freedom. Douglas was fascinated but dubious. Why the recourse to violence? Might not the South be persuaded to abandon slavery through peaceful means? No, Brown insisted. He knew the Southerners' proud hearts, and they would never be induced to give up their slaves until they felt a big stick about their heads. Wouldn't the slave owners pursue Brown's men with dogs and guns? Yes, Brown answered, but through crafty use of caves and precipices, we would whip them. Brown told Douglas that he had been formulating his plan for years, and that all he needed was the funds and the plan would go into action. The first conversation with Brown intrigued Douglas. He was amazed at his sympathy for the enslaved. He wrote in his newspaper, Though a white gentleman is in sympathy a black man, and as deeply interested in our cause as though his own soul had been pierced with the iron of slavery. Now, in the 1850s, the plan seemed more likely of a possibility as more and more Americans came over to the anti-slavery stance, and more of them grew supportive of forcible liberation of slaves in the South. 